If yes, can you please point which chapter? All chapters. It is an extract, you know. It is it's a overall understanding of what Bhagavad Gita teaches. But if you want a particular verse which is close to what we talked about, then the verse in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna, Atma Upamyena Sarvatra, Samam Pashyadi Arjuna, one who treats others as one treats oneself. What is the value? That I should treat other person as I treat myself. Now, I am always kind to myself, is it not so? I always forgive myself. I always want to make myself happy. Well, as I treat myself, value well, of treating others also, to make them happy, to be kind to them, not to make them unhappy. Not, not easy, but that's a value. So again and again when you practice that, parsap yogi paramo mataha, when a time comes when you spontaneously do that, the beginning, we do this deliberately. First we are impulsive, then you become deliberate. But abhyasa, repeatedly becoming deliberate, we become spontaneous. Spontaneously a good person. Then you are liberated, you are a sthita prajna. You follow? So this relationship can make a sthita prajna understand. Not, you know, not an ordinary thing. Only human being has this privilege of profitably utilizing the relationships as a platform of self-growth. Out of the six demoniac uh, tendencies, Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Moha, Madha, Matsarya, what jealousy is considered as Upalakshana is not clear to me. What? Isn't it that in chapter 4, um, Lord and Puja Swamiji? put that jealousy as a upalakshana to represent all the six. You see, in chapter 4, Lord Krishna describes the vice versa, vimatsara, free from matsarya. Mm-hmm. So, kama, krodha, lobha, moha, madha, matsarya. The last is matsarya. Which means if you don't have matsarya, then you don't have the others also. Only when the first five are there, the sixth can be there. When it's free from Matsarya, that means it's free from all others, Kama, Krodha, etc. Even finds a gap between emotional and intellectual maturity. Should the person pursue intellectual maturity, even equivalent level of emotional maturity has not been reached yet. In order to minimize the gap, does one need to focus on one over the other such that both are in a balanced state of maturity? So first we need intellectual maturity means clarity of understanding, as we discuss. Once the clarity of understanding is there, and then the conviction is arisen, the value is arisen, that this is what I want to be. That value should be assimilated. 
that being a kind person is much more valuable than being a dominating person, being a, you know, a, a reacting person, outwardly strong but inwardly weak. So that has become my conviction. Now then comes the question of the emotional maturity. That I put that into practice, as we just discussed. When you find that you did not do, remind that, educate the mind. Did not do, again educate the mind. And so, mind is educated in this manner to become free from those impulses. What's the difference between arpana and samarpana? Samarpana is a word from arpana. Samyak arpana means samarpana. So, we need not make a difference between arpana and samarpana. They can be the same. And that means offering. Samarpana means offering. Samyak arpana. Arpana offering. Samarpana offering very well. If you want to make a difference then, sometimes offering can be there at the level of action, but may not be there at the level of conviction. I will make an offering as a gesture, as an informality. But it may not necessarily be accompanied with the spirit of offering, which involves offering, surrender. So then, arpanam or offering accompanied with the spirit of surrender can be called samarpanam, if you want to distinguish between the time. People always are ready to tell others what they should do and how they should behave. People are ready to tell others. But they themselves never seem to follow their own teachings. I don't know, is that directed to me? I do not know. It's called paro, in Sanskrit it is expressed paro padeshe panditya. <laughs> this panditya scholarship in upadesha, in teaching others. You know, there is a story about one kathakara, you know, talking about Bhagavatam katha. And then they, they also talk about many other things in, you know, in course of a discourse. So this Panditji made a big point when he was talking about health and food and diet and what not. And how he elaborately said, oh, brinjal or eggplant is no good for us. <laughs> so he gave a very elaborate lecture on that. Then he was invited for Bhiksha next day. The lady who had prepared Viksha did not attend that class, so she did not know, you know, that... Uh... <coughs> so what she had cooked was a bangan and with potatoes, very nice, you know. Uh, potatoes, I don't know how to describe it, but then you, you split it and fill and all, stuffed potatoes and this eggplant. No, damal is only alu, but this is alu and binja, you know. Damalu is only external thing. This is, you cut it and then it's a stuffed potato, stuffed ginger, very delicious thing. So then she was serving, uh, the Panditji is sitting, uh, other persons are sitting and he's serving this vegetable. And uh, then the husband said, hey, you don't put, uh, Panditji doesn't like eggplant, you know, so don't give him eggplant. That's so she was trying to then, in, in that, uh, in that, you know, the, the uh, what is it, the, 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 the thing with which she was serving, the ladder, both eggplant and the potato, both of them came. So she was trying to avoid that eggplant, you know, so that only potato goes in the Pandit's place. So seeing this struggle, Pandit says, Mata, 
Don't worry, if the eggplant wants to come, let it come. So you tell others about eggplant, but you yourself have, you know, liking for it. So this is not uncommon. But coming now to this question, it says, how should we make them realize that they should apply this on themselves first before teaching others? Now that is an impossible thing. You cannot make others realize anything if they do not want to realize. So, our Swami used to say, you cannot change anybody unless they want to change. He said, I was very proud that I can change people, but my students have taught me. <laughs> it's a joke. So, I do not know how we can make them realize. But we can understand why there is this split between a person's talk and walk. So talking is how you should behave and how you should do this and walking is actually doing it. But as I said, this is a tall order. To be a good person, be an obedient person, you should like be like that. So that is what the person tells us. It shows in some way that that person has a value for this. It's possible that he person may not have value, but often you know, he has a value and he's telling it. But that, that person himself or herself cannot practice this, shows the helplessness rather than a will. Meaning that when person says that you should be obedient and he is not obedient or she is that, and that shows his helplessness rather than his will. As I said, a person is never willfully a bad person. A willfully we can only be a good person. We are bad helplessly. So when the person advises others as to how they should behave, I think at the back of his mind, there is a value that he should also behave like that. But he's not able to do. So, our telling may or may not work. Who can tell that person? Oh, that person will listen to him. Perhaps may not listen to you and I. He may listen to a person whom that person respects. So we have to find out somebody. Maybe his guru, his uncle, somebody who can influence him, you know. Him, him, I'm just saying him, but anyway. Because I don't think that we have acquired that kind of status in the eyes of that person, that our words will have any effect on that person. So no point in saying something that does not serve the purpose. Don't waste your words. You know that they're not going to be meaningful, they're not going to be effective. Then don't say anything. And pray. Or Find out somebody who can influence that person and make that person see, you know, how he also needs to change. I don't think we can change them. We can try. A Pativrata Stri can change, you know. In fact, man change the... I mean, we see people changing others. Wife changing the husband, husband changing the wife, by love. We have seen them that love is a very powerful, a very powerful thing by which we can change. So love alone can change the person. Vigya sarva vigya upadesha, then upadesha is follow upadesha. That doesn't, you know, that's only at the superficial level. At the, at the, not at the core level of the emotion. So if you can somehow display the emotion, if you really love that person and want the person to change, not for my sake but for the sake of that person, you know. If mother feels that this is good for the child, therefore the mother tells the child to do a given thing. Not because uh, uh, it is for the sake of mother that she tells. 
what will they say? Oh, whose son you are? Who is your mother? Ah, your mom is... So then I want to look good in the eyes of other people. So I want my son to behave in a certain way. That kind of thing doesn't work. But genuine love can change. And uh, I mean, we can always invoke love within ourselves. Then perhaps we can be effective in helping other people. If relationships do well, <clears throat> if there are boundaries, how does one initiate and maintain these boundaries? So there should be boundaries everywhere. What is boundary? Everybody wants their own space. People become uncomfortable beyond a certain point. So everybody has a space within which they feel comfortable and they would not appreciate other people encroaching in that space. So boundary is to recognize that space in course of an interaction. Because we will know that we are encroaching into the space when you find that person reacting. So you know where to put a stop. So we will learn about boundaries in course of our experience. What is the boundary? How not to embarrass the person. How not to bring out any defects or deficiencies of the person in public. If possible, how not to bring out the deficiency at all. Because the person doesn't want to look bad even in your eyes, even though closely related. Perhaps the child may not mind the mother saying something, or father saying something, that also they mind sometimes. But I doubt if a person wants to be really educated by spouse, or wants to be, you know, so I don't think that people want to be told uh, what limitations they have, what defects they have, these that. Usually it doesn't work. Unless there is so much love, as I said, then everything will work. But until then, there has to be boundaries. Then we don't encroach upon the areas where person feels embarrassed, person feels attacked, person feels uh, rejected. And we may not know right away, but as we relate to the person day in and day out, then we know what are those sensitive areas. So everybody is sensitive to certain things. I may be sensitive to one kind of thing, and you may be sensitive to another kind of thing. So we do not demand that that person only should be like what I am, because they are what they are. But I would not, I don't mind your doing this to me, that means different thing. Well, I like it this way, but he may not like it, or she may not like it. So people are different. So we have to slowly recognize their sensitivities. And be sensitive to their feelings emotions, respect their feelings, even though we may not entertain those feelings. Meaning that in a given situation I would tolerate something and the other person may not tolerate. But okay, that is their feeling, respect. Respect their feelings and draw the boundaries so that the feelings are not encroached upon. So everybody is a sensitive person. Everybody is likes and dislikes. And ideally, people expect that others should do what they like and avoid what they do not like. So this is the boundary that we have. What does a person like? What does a person does not like? As best as possible, refrain from doing something that the other person does not like. 
as best as possible, do things that the person likes. Really, if this is the approach by both the persons, you know, when a couple who get married and come to a Swamiji for blessing, and Swamiji, what is our duty? Then Swamiji would say one simple thing, the duty of husband is to make wife happy, and the duty of wife is to make husband happy. Simple. You give them that, they will work for the whole life. You know, to make happy is not easy. When can you make somebody happy? Only when you do what they like and refrain from doing what they don't like. So you should know what they like and don't like. We should know that. We should know as much as possible, try to know the other person as much as possible. Then alone we know what the likes and dislikes are and then only we know what the boundaries should be so we don't encroach upon their likes and dislikes. Give them the freedom to have those likes and dislikes. If they are ready to listen to you, then tell them. They may be it possible. That person may be ready to listen to you in a given situation, then you can tell. But if they are not ready, then, as I said, don't venture. Never give Upadesha without ask for. Na prashta kasidit bruyat. Manuswati says that you should not give Upadesha to anybody unless they ask for it. Nachanyayana. And if somebody asks, but not sincerely, they don't ask, so then also don't venture. You follow? Then you behave as though you don't know. Janana bhi medhavi, jadaval loka maachai. Even though he knows, he behaves as though he doesn't know. Because the question is not asked in a genuine way. So we are not obliged to give upadesh to anybody. And if they ask for Upadesh, they find it's not sincere, then also we are not obliged. Only when somebody sincerely asks for Upadesh, then only we should give. So we wait for your questions, you know, hoping that that is a sincere desire, you know. So how do you, how do you make out boundaries? By understanding the person, understanding the likes and dislikes, and by giving them freedom to have those likes and dislikes and refraining from encroaching upon those likes and dislikes because that would make the person embarrassed, make the person unhappy. So avoid that. So that is called the boundaries. In close relationships, one side may recognize a need for a boundary but the other may feel entitled to speak, accuse, etc., without any filters. <laughs> How does one work on the other side without being manipulative? If they say it's difficult to work on the other side, we can only work on our side. So we know the person. That person has no idea of boundaries, has no respect of boundaries. That person is capable of talking in insulting terms and without insensitive way and they are not sensitive to our feelings, we know that. Then prepare for that, be prepared for that. Oh, this person can say that, all right, I understand. I know that this person is capable of saying this. If you rehearsed yourself, Decided that all right, we'll give them the freedom to be what they are. Even though they do not give me freedom to what I am, I wish to give them freedom to be what they are. And I know that this is what will happen. This is what the person will say. That's how person will behave. Then kshama, forgiveness, accommodation. Because that person is helpless. Insensitivity is not the sign of strength, sign of helplessness. When a person does not follow the boundaries, when the person encroaches the boundaries and abuses, that means insensitivity. That means that the person is not evolved enough, not sensitive enough, and therefore doesn't deserve our hatred, deserves our sympathy. You can keep yourself away from that. What I'm saying is, you feel much hurt, then you can always maintain a distance. Our Swami used to say, if you get angry, then say this, I'm angry right now, we'll talk later. 
other person gets angry, you can quietly disappear from there if you can. Because the other person does not follow the boundaries, in that case, it's not necessary that you allow other people to hurt him. You have value not to hurt somebody, but at the same time, you should protect yourself from being hurt by others. So as far as possible, avoid any situations or discussions or talks which can create, which can invoke that person or provoke that person to do that. Sometimes we also inadvertently touch buttons, push buttons. Usually they say that clap requires two palms. So for that person to behave in a given way, which is not an acceptable way, but we must have done something, push some buttons. So let us recognize what are those buttons and how to maintain boundaries so we don't push those buttons. You follow? So this is what uh, we should try to do. What is the best way to separate oneself from rejection of our needs and rejection of ourselves? Same thing. By recognizing that person is not sensitive enough. Person doesn't endeavor, doesn't understand what pain is caused on account of rejecting somebody. You see, when you're not sensitive to ourselves, you're not sensitive to others. Some people are, they don't get insulted. Even if somebody says something, he doesn't mind, you know. So sometimes they cook food, for example, with a lot of chilies in there. I do that. Oh, Swami, he says, well, I don't mind, you know. It's, it's, well, you may not mind. Your tolerance level is higher. Mine may not be. Similarly, some people don't, don't feel insulted easily. They are not affected easily. And we get affected very easily. Meaning that our sensitivity levels can be quite different. So, fact that the person is not sensitive, does not respect our boundaries, that means their sensitivity is not there. And therefore, we have to understand. And they will not give it much importance. We feel hurt or insulted provided we give importance to the words and behavior of that person. Our Swamiji says that See, we give benefit of doubt to the greatest fool. If there is a, 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 a mad person, typically in India, a mad person standing on a street corner, you are passing by, he calls him all kinds of names. You know, his skin hair, something like that, they can call me. But I know there is a mad person. What do you expect from that person? And there were, you, you accommodate. Without, you don't feel hurt when that person says that, isn't it? If a mad person tells you, hey, stupid fellow, I don't feel hurt because I know he doesn't know what he's talking about. But to my friend, I did not give even one tenth of the benefit. If my friend says stupid, then I may react in a different way. You follow? If a mad person get away from with anything from me because I accept them as they are, my friend I'm not willing to accept. So Swami, Swami used to say, how strange it is that we can give benefit of doubt to a mad person and not to our friends. If a mosquito bites, I understand because it's a mosquito. Not my spouse, no way. You know, and so. Why? Everybody has this kind of thing in their world. If he can give benefit of doubt to all those. If a, if a dog barks at me, nothing happens to me. But if my son says something to me, uh, I get ex- you know, upset. Meaning I do not give benefit to people who are close to me, even a fraction of benefit that I give to other people who are not close to me. What happens is, Closer a person is to me, more always more chances of being hurt. Because closer a person is to me, more expectations I have of them. And there were more possibility of my expectations not being fulfilled and there were being a sense of rejection. So who makes us most unhappy? Those are close to us. Closer the person, more greater source of unhappiness. As I said, if you are not mature in the knowing how to relate. And so if somebody behaves like that, you understand that's how the person is. And with forgiveness, with accommodation, 
large heartedness, accepting them and not feeling rejected because that is that person's opinion. Stupid, that's his opinion, her opinion. I need not make it my opinion. See, I, we don't feel rejected unless we make their opinion ours. Somebody tells me you are stupid. Okay. I don't feel affected. But when I say I am stupid, what is it? We echo their opinion. When he says you are stupid, I say I am stupid. Usually we echo their opinion, meaning that we make their opinion our opinion and that's how we feel hurt. Otherwise, Swamiji, what is it? You don't speak a word of English, you know. Thank you. I don't feel because I know he doesn't know what he's talking about. Similarly, if somebody says you're stupid and I know he doesn't know what he's talking about, it will not affect me. But I feel he knows what he's talking about, then it will affect me. Now, Swami used to give a nice example. Four people are walking away from you. You call, hey Sridhar, Sridhar looks back. Hey Kumar, Kumar looks back. Hey Narayana, he looks back. Oh idiot, all the four look back. <laughs> because that's what people think of themselves. Already I do not have any high esteem of myself. And when you say something, it just only seems to confirm what I am talking to myself. Meaning when you say you are idiot then, it just confirms that yes, I am idiot because I only I think I am idiot. If I know that I am not idiot, it doesn't matter what you tell me, you know. The fact that we feel get affected by others is because already we have a low self-esteem within ourselves. That's why they are able, they can manage to hurt us. Again, two-step response. Idiot. One-step response, I get hurt. Two-step response, I stand back. It is that person's opinion. I don't want to make it my opinion. Only when I make it my opinion, then I get hurt. I, it's that person's opinion. All right? So, every time somebody manages to cause pain to us, understand that we also participate in that. We also cooperate. Without our cooperation, nobody can make us unhappy. How do we cooperate? By identifying with what they say, with what they do. By giving reality to their behavior or words, and we then get hurt. Spiritualism, bhakti, ritualism, all pass for divine divinity. Depends what you mean by spiritualism. I mean, uh, bhakti, ritualism, they are not different paths. The bhakti or devotion which is there in our heart manifests as rituals. See, bhakti means love. Love always finds its expression in action. Then only it is called love. Swami, I love you. Okay, so what? But I don't care for you. So what kind of love is that? When somebody loves you, that love always manifests as some kind of action to please you. That is how love is, isn't it? Then you find out what the Swami likes, what he does not like, and you you cook something that he likes, and you know, that's what you how you express your love. So what is ritual? Ritual is nothing but this uh, making offering to Lord, something that he likes. <coughs> so when there is devotion, then we know what the Lord likes and what he does not like. And then we offer him something. So all rituals are nothing but the, the framework given to us to express our emotion. But emotion should be physicalized. Our Swami used to say, physicalize your emotion. Meaning if you feel like giving something, then give. Right away. Oh, I think I should give. I should give hundred rupees to this person. Then more delay, next then my, my hand goes into pocket, fifty rupees. Pocket comes up, twenty-five rupees. Pocket is open, five rupees. Actually given one rupee. 
physicalize your emotion. Moment emotion comes, act upon that. So all rituals are nothing but the physicalization of the devotion which is there in our heart. A ritual is a framework of making offerings to the Lord. Every ritual involves an offering. Whether it is bathe, whether you offer garments, offer ornaments, offer food, show light, all of these are forms of offering. An offering is nothing but physicalizing my love which is there. Even if you don't have love, then also do this, then love will come someday. That's another thing. In India, you know, I mean, people are, they get married because they arrange marriage. There's no love to begin with. You may have liked the person, this, that, whatever, you know, you meet two times, three times, I mean, after all, people go to India, they have fifteen days with them. And in that, they have to make selection, make a decision. How, you know, how much can you know a person? But if you have value that I should love this person, then you do things that are done when you to fake it till you make it. Meaning that you do what a loving person will do. So find out what this person likes. Bring the gifts, bring this, that, what not, that they like. That's what you would naturally do if you love. But if there is no love, then also you do. So in course of time, love gets involved. So rituals can be an expression of devotion. Or rituals also can become a means of cultivating devotion. So they are all one path. And what is devotion is understood, spiritualism is understanding what devotion is, understanding what Ishvara is. Then only the devotion can be there, or then only devotion will be understood, and that is expressed in ritualism. So not different paths, you know. This is all one path. My faith at times is very strong and at times it wavers and I feel completely lost. Why is that? Because then everything seems meaningless. You see, usually we are human beings, needy beings. Therefore, even when we have faith in Ishvara, there's always some expectation of Ishvara. Then, Ishvara should return some favor for my faith. When I make all these offerings to Ishvara, I expect him also to do his part. So Bhagavan also should, you know, I mean, he, he listens to my prayer only when he fulfills my prayer. What kind of God is that? So we, our conviction becomes stronger when our prayers are answered. And I think that, yes, God really, you know, you know he is kind to me. When prayers are not answered, when desires are not satisfied, then our faith wavers. Does God really, does He, does he does my prayers reach Him? Is He sensitive? Is He really, does He care for me? So only when God also displays some signs where I feel accepted by God, where I feel loved by God, when I feel cared by God, then my faith remains and becomes strong. But again and again, if I feel that God doesn't care for me, because my prayers are unanswered, because my desires are not fulfilled, then I lose faith whether God really cares for me or not. Meaning that our faith also is a condition of faith. Our faith lasts as long as our desires are satisfied, and the faith wavers once desires are not satisfied. That's natural. In short, we have to get faith which is not dependent upon fulfilling our needs or desires. It is faith for the sake of faith. We have to grow to that point. <clears throat> All right, before people fall asleep, I think we have to now conclude this. If you emotionally mature yourself, does it that help others around you to become emotionally mature? <laughs> Very likely. Because people observe always others. 
particularly when you start coming to Vedanta classes, you know, then people observe you more. Basically prove that you are going to classes is meaningless. What is the, what is Swami, Swami is taught him? Is what he has taught him? You know? So in fact you become vulnerable to all their attacks. Because they don't come to the classes. They will justify not coming to classes. And you are going to classes. You have to prove that their classes are not served any purpose. And then every time you make a mistake, or you, you know, then immediately they, they say, Oh, this is what your Swami is taught. This is what Gita teaches. Meaning that they have the license because they don't come to classes. And you don't have a license, you go to classes. That's what happens. <clears throat> but people observe. And when we go to Gita classes, uh, when we learn, when we grow, people observe. <coughs> that, oh, going to Gita classes uh, or Vedanta classes seems to help this person. Then we become really a... Uh, uh, we, we teach by our conduct. We become a... So, Lord, uh, teaching can be two ways. Teaching by words or teaching by setting an example. The best way to teach is by setting an example. So yes, if we become emotionally mature, meaning what is emotionally mature, people can easily relate to you. You are more predictable. They can easily relate to you. They feel safe and you know in your presence. That's the emotionally mature person who doesn't create fear in others, who is accepting person, who doesn't make demands upon others. So then they feel comfortable. They say, oh, you have changed. Yeah. So then, you may be able to teach them by the conduct, so by setting an example. So it's possible. But uh, that depends upon other people's sensitivity also. We can't necessarily say that you may be necessarily able to influence other people, which likely that you may. All right, that takes care of all the questions. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachade Purnasya Purnamada Yapurnameva Vashishade Om Shanti 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 Hari O Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om